variety of protocol options. This is a two-wipe communication protocol that uses clocks to clock the data in and out. Why do they want options on it? Right? Some devices transmit only. Some devices receive only. Active high, active low. Different uh, bit streams. Oh, and I got that out of the Wikipedia, so it's got to be correct. <laughs> the solution. I solved the problem. I made it work. All right? I had a processor talking to these two devices on the same I.O. lines using the same clock. It worked. But I bit banged it. <laughs> All right, the only way I could get this to start off working was to go off and actually write a bit banger on it. So the first stage was take the first device, make a bit bang, go off and actually factor out that part of the stuff, put the second device on, and then flip between the two mo modes of bit banging so that it actually worked. Right. But again, all we're doing is playing around with bits. Seriously, how hard can it be? I know I keep saying that and I keep correcting myself. Now, device one and device two had different, had different device enable lines, which was the only thing that saved me. Right, so at any time, point in time, I could flip between the two, and that flipping between the two automatically faded in the correct big banging mechanism for that device. Right? That, third, that second device you saw, the third time in the grind, it was not anything like an SPI device. Even though if you had a look in the actual data sections, it was saying it was an SPI. Right? The first one, the one from the processor, again, it was described as an SPI interface. Oh, sorry, it was described as a SMI interface, which had SPI, uh, limited SPI commands. I mean, it's a two-wire protocol with a read and a write. How can you have a subset of commands? Yeah, I know I'm getting myself real worked up on this. Right, so because the first device, Big Bang in the first device, it was the closest to the SPI, it made it easier to slide in the second device. Like I said, it was just a different method of bit bangers. <coughs> None of this is an ideal solution. Right? It's not the sort of thing you want to do for two reasons. Software is expensive. Right? Software is very expensive. And it had to be handled by the processor. Right? It's going to suck up CPU cycles. It's going to put in memory retention. Caches are all going to be shot to bits. Not that you've really got caches too often in, process in embedded systems. Now, another aspect of stuff that I'm involved in is playing around with FPGAs and VHDLs. And now that there's no firmware guys in the place, I can bag everyone out. Right, so it's an implementation of using FPGAs. So we're using FPGAs to go off and do different bits and pieces. Now, the FPGA manufacturers do supply some cores, but they're proprietary cores, which means if you actually want to modify them, you're in trouble. Right, so there's no real access to any of their VHDL at all. There's some cores that I'll give you that you can actually see it, but there's not many and not any of the really good ones that you really want to use. So open calls is your friend. Right? There's a large number of calls available now in most of the common interfaces. And the number of interfaces that actually exist in there at the moment has grown enormously in the last 18 months. Right? There's a whole wishbone processor in there now. There's all the interfaces into the wishbone processor. And all of these, a lot of these are actually being tested on Xilinx FPGAs. So we're getting to the point now where we can actually start swapping in hardware designs. Good. Hardware designs. And we can actually tailor our hardware through what is essentially software. So most applications simply become something like, this is my IO, this is my communication mechanism. So I've got an A to D out there, and I want to talk to it through an SPI bus. I've got a D to A out there, and I want to talk to it through an Ethernet connection. Either way, what we really end up having in the systems where we're trying to monitor something that's out in the environment is an I.O. subsystem of some sort and a means of communication with that I.O. subsystem. So hardware is now becoming plug and play. Oh, come on, I expected more people to buy. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we've just got a set of I.O needs to communicate using a medium. So now what we have is a large range of products. So you notice a big jump here. We have now have a large range of products that take environmental data and packages and form some, put them into some form that we can actually use some other form of communication media to do it. So we've got an, an I.O. package here that does things like 
Well, let's say this one goes off and actually monitors the workings of an electric motor for an air conditioning plant. Okay, <coughs> we've got this motor that's sitting there and we want to know things like temperature, revs per minute, um, I don't know, current that it's drawing, right? And just general little bits and pieces to know what it's actually, how it's actually operating. But when you think about it, this device thing is going to be in an air conditioning plant, right? One of the few place times when I've ever had to be in an air conditioning plant, I was on the top floor of a 13-storey building in the middle of winter, watching the snow on the mountains just go, right? These places are harsh environments. They're freezing. They're also incredibly noisy. Now, the easiest way of actually going up and hooking up a system is to use wireless. Right, so I just go and get me a little thing, shove it on the floor, put it on there and have a, a receiver somewhere downstairs. Wireless goes off, gets a connection and goes off and uses it. But these are air conditioning plants. Right, we've got motors that turn on and off all the time. We've got all sorts of other noisy and harsh environments up there. It makes it unreliable. So what we could do is go up and use wired connections. But if we use wired connections, it's expensive to get all the wires laid. So what do we do? We come up with a mechanism whereby we can really swap in any one of these three types of communications mechanism. And notice that I left SPI and I2C off this list. Right? Any one of these me mechanisms to go off and communicate with a base station to actually get the data moving around the system. So again, we can then take a core, a micro an FPGA of some sort. We can actually go off and shove all our I.O. that we want to have for a very specific thing into it. We can then grab a core that actually gives us our USB, Ethernet, or wireless interface, program it all into the F FPGA, and we've got a system that it can dedicatedly, it's dedicated to go off and actually monitoring individual bits of our environment. Now, the reason this is brought up is because one of the things that is actually starting to be a big push on in, in industry at the moment is to get the communications within a car able to talk to its environment to warn other people about it. Now, I gather that Jonathan's got a talk coming up later on in the week about this. All right? and it's a push that not only is, is it looking good from a geek point of view, but the people like the RTA, Rade, Rade Vic or whatever it is, are starting to look at how they can intelligently monitor a car and warn things that actually happen in different parts of it. And from that, they're actually trying to work out how they can do things like track trucks around, around more or less Australia to actually work out where things are being delivered, to divert them to save fuel, to actually monitor the operation of a truck so that you can actually make it more efficient and thereby save a lot more money. So again, one of the things we need to do, I don't think there's any more slides, no there isn't. So one of the things we need to do is to start looking at what we're really doing from a software point of view. All we're doing is moving bits around, but we've got to move those bits around in an intelligent manner without making the cost of these, these little things that we build be extremely costly. All right? We can get wireless routers, modems, all sorts of things now for about 50 bucks, but they're dedicated. And a lot of economies of scale come from making the same system multiple times and using it in different places. Now, one of the things that David's had in his talk was he's actually passing around some boards, which is the way I think things are probably going to end up going. So he's got a main board that's got a processing engine on it with a couple of little connectors on it. Now, basically what he can do is actually plug onto those, the connectors, that actually give you either end of either the I.O. subsystem or the communication subsystem. And that way the VHDL then becomes just something that actually moves the data around. Now the reason you want to do it this way and use things like excuse me, VHDL rather than VHDL and inside an FPGA rather than actually using a simple processor is the stuff that's inside the VHDL, the stuff that's inside the core running in VHDL runs in parallel. So you pick up an enormous boost in processing power simply because these things run in parallel. Right? And that's where I see things moving on in the future. Mainly because I've got a business enterprise around that as well. So it's got to work. So, any questions? You seem to be talking about a, definitely a different level of embedded eye at the peak, you know, of HDL, well, as opposed to the, let's get a TI with a DSP and this you, corner, that corner, that corner, and throw it in. Weren't you the one that actually said that things have been blurred? Weren't you yeah. the one yet? Yeah. See? You answered your own question. If, if, if the, the concept that you're talking about in terms of the FDL is to have the people that are working on the embedded devices actually used over the core VHDLs within their devices. Yes. Rather than actually using VHDL cores on a, an interface module that then handles the different protocols for the different devices. As a, as a 
centralising module as an interface then into... I'm, I'm probably talking more about the whole grey area of, of all of it, because what you may end up doing is just having a couple of VHDL modules that sit there that allow you to directly interface, like a, a USB VHDL module talking directly to an I.O. module, so you could then just plug that into a processor of some sort and just go around and plug it into a USB port. Or you could go off and actually do something like take your I.O. module, put a, a, either a PowerPC or a Microblaze um, core in there, <coughs> and then put the USB on the other side of that, or an Ethernet on the other side of that, or something else on the other side of that. So because you can actually make your decision about how you're going to do this at the time that you're actually going to build it, then you're a lot more flexible in how you can actually put one of these things together. Uh, the, the reason uh, there's discussion about hardware engineers is the talk about the use of the open core VHDLs mm. is the talk you need to give to the hardware engineers. Yes! <laughs> See, that's what I wasn't going to bring up. Do you know why I got into all that trouble with the bloody buses in the first three timing diagrams? Because some engineer read a bloody spec and said, oh, SPI, it'll work. Oh, SPI, it'll work. Oh, pseudo SPI. Oh, it might be a bit hard for the hardware and software guys, but it'll work. Whack them all together. Right? And I admit, I had a long argument at the very beginning of this when I was actually pointing out that this is not going to work. Right? The issues to do with timing and the way the latencies and everything work in that and the addressing scheme, it will not work. Right? And I couldn't figure out any way around, around it in the actual chips themselves. Now, if this was in VHDL, then I could just change a few things. I've got a VHDL compile, bang, it's in there and it's running. But the reality is that different companies are very focused on their particular things. They put their product out and at the end of the day it's in yeah. And it's the people who actually have to integrate it. And so the solution usually ends up in the integration piece rather than in the standardisation of the product. So although, you know, the, there's efforts that go on from time to time, you know, the good thing about standards is there's so many to choose from. Yeah. For any particular standard, there's so many different implementations of it um, that eventually you end up building it into the integration piece. <coughs> but why? I mean, if, if you can actually have a module that talked in a certain protocol and you found that it didn't talk properly to some other device, you don't have to change any of your hardware. You can just change the protocol in that VHDL. So you're not actually getting another chip that will actually communicate properly with it and shove it on the board, <laughs> solder it and wire it all in and all the rest of it. Yeah, if, if, if you've got access to that device. Um, yeah, I don't see why you wouldn't. Not this day and age. I mean, I seriously don't have any trouble getting chip specs out of people these days. I'd, I'd say 10 years ago, yeah, you'd have Buckley's are getting some of the proprietary stuff. But this day and age, I mean, people publish this stuff all over the place. In fact, has anyone had any hassles with getting chip specs from anyone, say, in the last two, three years? Yeah, I haven't. You have. <coughs> Who from? Name them. Name them. <laughs> No, I admit that there is, there is still a lot of integration work to there, right, and that's some of the stuff I get involved in anyway, but I want to try and get away from the messy, hands-on, last-minute, oh, shit, this doesn't work, what am I going to do sort of scenario. Just for all the babies. <laughs> 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 yeah, but it's easy. Stress, 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 too, is also one of these factors, okay? Right, I don't want to be stressed out of my mind, you know, working midnights again anymore, all night again, right? I'm, I'm past that stage. I want to just... Hey, I'll make it work for you. Just trust me. This doesn't really work either. So, if we have VHDL everywhere, we know how notorious software is for bugs, um, and we know how well people come up with um, completely conforming interfaces. We know that no one ever in software rewrites a framework. I'm not um, listening to you. But I know what you're doing. <laughs> you know what? <coughs> It, it sort of scares me instead of sort of having, okay, SPI is different, but, but you know, USB or Ethernet, I, I can sort of now see um, a network guy going, wow, I can access the VHDL here. I'm going to just put in this extra thing to make Ethernet plus plus, and yep. now, you know, TCP is going to run that much better, except now it won't, you know. Nothing else will run. Nothing no else will run. run. Yeah. Um, We're already seeing that in the, in the, in the wireless states. Um, people pushing out um, uh, TDM ad hoc modes to, to push their bandwidth straight up for point-to-point -point links and things. So we're starting to see drivers come out for specifically wireless. 
Right, so what we're saying here is it's not specifically a problem I've raised, it's already existing. So yeah, it's been out for some time. But it's, it's, it's a part of the, the issue about standardisation and innovation. You know, the, in a marketplace, each person tries to find a differentiator yeah. that says, I am different, I am better. And you, you've got, when you set something standard, you fix it. And, and you that should stifles with, yeah. innovation. And, and there's, it, it, I wouldn't it, say it stifles so innovation. It, 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 it can do, but you can stagnate. And there's, there's always a tension between standardising and keeping things at a, at a particular standard and allowing innovation but for people to improve. That's what all the improvements on, on the different protocols comes out with. I mean, you just look at what's happened with wireless. I mean, start up is, is a pretty mini Mickey Mouse system. And now they just keep thinking, right, I will put the next generation and it'll have these standards, these protocols, and they'll be backwards compatible. But, as but long we, as you get that backwards but compatibility. But standards come out, well. <laughs> people implementing their own add-ons, and then everyone says, well, we need to standardise all these extra bits, and you come up with the next generation of standards. But there's a series of proprietary innovations that create integration hey, in between each step. You just bitched at me about taking away integration work from you. <laughs> <laughs> no, there's always going to be that problem because someone somewhere is going to say, oh, I can just do this. I mean, <coughs> even the, the, the example that Ben came up with, I mean, that, that's pretty much it. I mean, I, I can put this little bit in there that will actually make things better for me personally, but it may screw up everyone else. And if enough people do that, then either things will have to become a standard and everyone obeys it, well, that guy would get isolated. I mean, if you connected your network up to mine and it started causing me problems, I'd just pull the plug on yours. <laughs> Only in your sense. <laughs> Any more questions? Okay. Good. Thanks, well.